I'm so glad to be back with you guys again tonight. I had a week off last week. I wasn't here with you guys. Me and my family had some time together, and it was enjoyable, but I miss not being here. It's weird for me to have a Wednesday off and know that things are still t- taking place around here, but I appreciate Matt Daniels and his willingness to bring the word to you guys last week, but I'm super excited to be back in the room with you to see your smiling faces looking up at me. I'm excited because we're launching into a new series tonight that has its origins in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So if you want to go ahead and be finding your way there, once we get there, we're going to kind of lay the foundation for this series that we're going to be in over the next few weeks, and we're going to move around a little bit. So go ahead and find your way to 1 Thessalonians. If you need a hint, it's in front of 2 Thessalonians. And we will start from there. In 1977... Stephen King published a short story about a couple who found themselves in an abandoned Nebraskan town that had been taken over by a cult of children who worshipped a demon that lived in the local cornfields. A story that some of you may know as Children of the Corn. And with Halloween right around the corner, scenes and stories like King's are on display everywhere. There are horror movies on every night. Everywhere you look right now, there are ghosts, there are vampires, werewolves, mummies, zombies, all those things, haunted houses that you can go and be a part of, scary decorations that people have put up in their yard or on their doors or on their house. I love the fall season as much as any season that we have, but this particular part of it, how many of you know, can just get really, really dark at times. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 5. For you are all children of light. Everybody say light. Children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Now, I don't know about those children in the corn that Mr. King wrote about, but our king says that we ought to be children of the day. So, in a particular time of year where so much fixation is put on darkness, I want us to fixate over the next few weeks on light. Now, before you get upset thinking that I'm about to start attacking Halloween and your participation in it, if you do that, that's not what this is about. But it is about understanding that we have no business playing around with darkness. Let me say it again. Those of us who are in Christ those of us who are children of the day, children of light, we have no business meddling with darkness. Evil, wicked things that permeate throughout our world and throughout our culture, we have no business playing around with or dabbling with any of those things. There is a consistent and constant theme throughout God's Word showing us His kingdom is one of light and his people are people of light. So let's unpack that a little more deeply to learn what all being a child of the day entails. Now we're going to skip back to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to pick up verse 8. And Paul is writing to this group of believers in Ephesus, and he says in verse 8, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So with this first installment, I want to speak from the subject of no longer nocturnal. All of us, before we came to know Jesus and believe upon his name for salvation, walked and lived in darkness. The Bible says that in that darkness that we once walked in, it caused us to be futile in our thinking. In other words, our thinking was useless. It had no base. It had no foundation. It had no purpose. It had no point. On top of that, we participated in all kinds of evil deeds. We walked as enemies of the cross, enemies of God, following the prince of darkness who rules over this present world. That's what Paul means when he states, at one time you were darkness. So before we come to know Christ, each and every one of us, before we enter into his salvation, we once walked in darkness doing all the things that darkness participates in. But when Jesus saves and renews us, That no longer continues to be the reality of our lives. We now become light in the Lord. There is a movement 
that takes place once we surrender our lives to Christ. In other words, it's like this. There is an instantaneous transfer that happens once we surrender our lives to Jesus. Now we're going to go to Colossians chapter 1. You're going to have to hold on tight tonight because we're going to jump around a little bit. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12, the same man Paul is writing to another group of believers. He says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So the moment, the moment that we surrender our lives to Jesus, he delivers us from darkness and transfers us into his kingdom of light. We are no longer under the dominion of sin and the devil, where nothing but evil deeds and useless thinking and living and despair exist. We are now brought into a new dominion, the kingdom of his son, a kingdom of light to become a people of light, where holiness and righteousness and restoration and hope exist. That's a much better deal if you ask me. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 6, Paul writes to those believers in verse 13, Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. This, this could be a revelatory, life-changing truth for you if you would fully grasp what Paul is saying. He says that once Christ transfers your dominions, when you go from the dominion of darkness into a dominion of light in Christ, he says sin, which is a part of that darkness, no longer has any control or hold over your life. It doesn't. The reality is those of us who are in Christ, when we sin, it's because we chose to. Sin doesn't make you sin. The devil doesn't make you sin. We sin by choice. And Paul says the choice now for those of us who are in Christ is you don't have to live underneath this rule anymore. It doesn't have any authority over your life. It holds no more power over your life. It has no more sway over your life. Why? Because you're no longer a part of its kingdom. You're a part of a brand new kingdom. Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 says, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. And these are the things that we did in darkness. Walking in darkness, we were alienated from God. We were hostile in mind towards Him. We were participating in evil deeds. He says that he, being Jesus, has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That's the grace and the mercy and the love and the forgiveness and the renewal that Jesus brings into your life when he transfers you into his kingdom. This is the good news of the gospel, that God didn't just leave us to wander in darkness and despair but that he sent Jesus, the light of the world, to pierce the darkness and to drive it back so that we could be brought out and into his kingdom. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Once we cry out and once we call upon Jesus, we are instantly rescued and you are made into a new creation in Christ. Darkness no longer has dominion over you. I know some of you here tonight, you've been in some dark places, and you know the light of Jesus Christ, and aren't you thankful that he pierced into your darkness to bring you out of that place? <laughs> at my old job, I didn't always do this. I worked at a production plant for a little while. We manufactured electrical wire I hated every minute of it it was brutal hard labor 12 hour shifts in the summertime the factory would get up to like 120 degrees on the floor in the winter time it'd be freezing I'm like that doesn't even make any sense like how can it be that hot and then that cold at the same time like we can we have one or the other but it was just hard brutal labor like I would stand at the end of these gigantic machines and it would coil up this wire and you had to keep up with production. So it was just as fast as you could do it, and it was nonstop. You got like a 30-minute lunch break, and that was it. Back at it. It was brutal. 
But there were more than just that one particular department that I worked in, in the plant. So I got tired of doing that stuff. I wanted to change up. I wanted to do something that was a little bit less stressful. There were guys that worked in the shipping department. All they did was ride around the forklift all night. I was like, I want to do that job. Let me get on one of them. That looks like fun. So you could request to transfer departments. And so what you would do is when a job would come open in one of those, you would submit a request to transfer, put it in the box. Supervisors would take it out. They would go over the request, and they would post the jobs up, and what was available, and then who had applied for what. And then beside your name, after you requested, your status would be pending as they evaluated to see if you'd be a good fit for the job that you wanted to move to. And you know what the worst part of that was? Was wanting so desperately to transfer out of the place that you were in and to look up on that board and see the status as they evaluated your transfer request as pending and then waiting to see if it was going to be granted or not. That was the worst part of the entire process. The day in and day out. Sometimes it would take weeks for them to decide whether or not they're going to deny or grant the request. So every day you'd go in with this hope, like, please, Lord, like... I want to go to shipping. I want to drive a forklift. Please let this be the day. And then you go in and it's still pending. The worst part of it was waiting to see if your transfer request was going to be granted or not. But listen to me. When you request a transfer to Jesus, when you've had enough of the darkness, when you tell him, I want out, I'm sick of this stuff, it has nothing for me, Jesus doesn't place your request on pending while he evaluates whether or not you deserve the transfer or would be a good fit for his kingdom. That transfer is granted instantaneously. Come on, how many of y'all are thankful? How many of y'all would testify and praise Jesus for the fact that he transferred you out of darkness into light? And you didn't sit on pending. He didn't look at your life and say, oh, yeah, sure, you'd like you'd be a good fit for my kingdom. Come on in. It was an unconditional transfer. You cried out in desperation, God, take me out of this darkness. And he said, sure thing, I'd love to. Y'all good? Y'all awake tonight? We don't have to be so Baptist in here all the time. You can say amen or hallelujah or hand clap or whatever. Like, it's fine. Nobody's going to come out of the wall and hit you in the head with a whip or a Bible. I'm thankful Jesus did not leave me in my darkness when I cried out, Please rescue me. Take me out of this place. I'm thankful that it was an instantaneous transfer. And he said, absolutely, come on into my kingdom. At one time, I was darkness, but praise Jesus, now I am light in the Lord. John chapter 12, verse 46, Jesus said, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Jesus is always ready to accept transfer requests. Always ready. Listen, I know some of y'all could testify to this as well, but uh, I've lived in both places. I've lived in the darkness. I've lived in the light. I can tell you, the light's a whole lot better. A whole lot better. So if you're here tonight, walking in darkness... And the light of Jesus shines into your life tonight. The light and love of Jesus shines onto your heart tonight. Go to the light. I was praying earlier today, asking that before this night is over, that we would see some some transfers take place before it's over. And, you know, our God, I I believe our God has a sense of humor. Y'all think God has a sense of humor? I think he has a sense of humor. For some reason, I don't know if y'all are familiar with the movie A Bug's Life. But remember Harry? I don't know if y'all remember Harry or not. It's kind of an obscure scene, but it's like two moths, and they're outside of the store, and there's one of those blue bug zapper lights out there. And poor Harry's flying towards the light. It's got him. And his buddy's like, Harry, don't look at the light. He's like, I can't help it. Jink. 
and it gets him. This light is one that you run to. This light is okay to go towards. This is one that you, that you want to give yourself over to. Jesus ain't going to zap you. He's going to save you. Run to his light. Let him pull you out of the darkness. Hey, listen, it's, you may be like, Trey, you don't, you don't know how dark my dark is. You don't know how bright Jesus' light is. There is no darkness that can overcome his light. And if you'll cry out to him, he will instantaneously transfer you from that domain of darkness into his domain of light. Praise God. Hallelujah. I love Jesus. I love the word. I love you guys. I love that we get to do this. You can tell I've been out for a week. I'm sorry. I'll try and get it under control. Instantaneous transfer. Well, listen, once we get past that, there's, there's a gradual adjustment. The transfer is instantaneous, but the adjustment is gradual. So we, we got to go to Colossians chapter 3 for this. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Nudge somebody next to you and tell them to elevate your mindset. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly or what is dark in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Although Jesus instantly moves us out of darkness and into light when we cry out to him, it takes time for us to adjust to living in a new kingdom with a new master. Paul points out several examples of dark things that we once walked in. Immorality, impurity, whether that be wrong passions and desires, coveting what we couldn't claim. Maybe it was a hot-temperedness. Maybe it was wrathfulness. Maybe you were somebody whose life was full of hatred and slandering of other people around you. Maybe it was ungodly talk, a filthy mouth. All of those things, he says, are a part of your old self and need to be done away with. They have no space to continue existing within a renewed and redeemed life. These things are old, Paul says. They're part of the darkness that you once walked in. Now they need to be put away. Now you've got to put on the new self. One that is clothed with the light of Jesus. One that participates and engages in much different actions. So now he says in verse 12, he, he changes things up. He says, this is what your life should begin to look like. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father, through him. So Paul says, take the old self and set it aside. 
take up the new self and put it on and start participating and engaging in new life practices. So now, those of us who are walking in the light of Jesus begin to exhibit such attributes as compassionate and kindness and humility and meekness, becoming patient and forgiving people. You love and you live in peace. Your life should be one that is full of thanksgiving, testifying to the goodness of God. Regardless of what my life situations or circumstances are, I remain thankful because I see what he has done for me. On top of that, Paul says you should begin to grow in your desire of the word. And he says you should find yourself in circles with people where that's what you begin to talk about. It is the sign of a, a maturing believer, the sign of someone who is walking in the light of Jesus, will increasingly find themselves amongst other people where conversations about the Word of God just naturally begin to flow out of you. This is somebody who has been transferred from darkness to light. When you once walked in darkness, you got together with your, with your, with your buddies, with your group, with your gang, and you talked about dark things. You talked about the evil things that you did over the weekend. But when Christ transfers you from darkness into light, you get together with other people who walk in light, and you talk about light, godly things. You talk about what God has been teaching you lately. You give a testimony to the works that you have seen him do in your life over the past days, weeks, or months. On top of all that, Paul goes on and he says a light that is walking, a life that is walking in the light is, is ever singing and praising God for who he is and all that he has done for you. At the end of that, he, he says, as you guys get together, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, challenge one another in wisdom, and then sing. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your heart. Listen, I hope when you guys come here week in and week out, you don't see these people standing on stage and you think, wow, they're great singers, and you just watch and you spectate. Sing! Sing along! God wants to hear your praise. He wants to hear your voice. If we don't put people up here on stage to, to lead us in worship week in and week out so that they can give their praise on your behalf to God. They're just here to give us direction and guidance, to know what the next verse is so that we have some order in our singing and our worship. God wants to hear your voice. So give it to Him. Someone who has experienced the, the light of Jesus... Well, that's a heart that should overflow with thanksgiving, and the natural response of an overflowing heart of thanksgiving is one of praise and worship. It just comes out. This is what Jesus moves our lives to. We don't remain the same when we are in him. As a matter of fact, we can't remain the same. Here's what I want to teach you a little bit, though. These changes don't happen instantaneously. Think of it like this. Go ahead, Noah. Let's give them an example. Before Jesus, all you ever knew was darkness. So the entirety of your life you spent learning how to live devoid of his light. Your decisions prior to Christ, your decisions had no Lord. Your emotions, they had no Lord. Your thoughts, your desires, your ambitions, your plans, your purposes, the things that you sought after, they had no Lord. There was no authority over those things other than yourself. And here's the thing about being in darkness. The longer you stayed in the dark, the more comfortable you became navigating your life through it. So each and every one of us, when we first enter into a dark room like we are now, it would be kind of hard to find our way around. But the longer that you're going to stay in this place, the longer that you stay in a state of dark, the more your eyes, the more your body, the more your mind begins to adjust to that atmosphere and you learn how to navigate your way around in a place that at one time you would have had no clue how to get through. The same way works in our lives devoid of Christ. We spend the entirety of our lives 
navigating through darkness, and we get pretty good at it. Then all of a sudden you encounter Jesus, and his light bursts through your darkness all at once. And like your eyes need a moment to adjust, so does your life. Your life needs a moment to adjust. Jesus instantly changes the spirit within you. That is an instantaneous change. But it takes our souls, the mind, the emotion, the action side of us, it takes those things a while to adjust because when you have walked in darkness for so long it's an adjustment stepping in to the light Jesus knows this he doesn't expect us to instantly know how to live out this new life that's why he said to his disciples as he spent three years worth of his life training them that's why he was patient with them That's why he was constantly teaching them. And that's why before he ascended back into heaven, he said, as I go, I'm going to send you guys a helper because you're not going to be able to so easily do this. Take them back to normal. Paul even outlines this in his own life. As a matter of fact, in Acts chapter 9, we get a a glimpse of Paul when he encountered the light of Jesus for the first time. So in Acts chapter 9 and verse 1, it says that Saul, who was Paul prior to Jesus, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way or any of those who who belong to Christ or support Christ or live for Christ, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So, He was well known for persecuting Christians, for persecuting the church, for hating everything that Jesus stood for. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Now if you skip down to verse 15, God's going to send a man by the name of Ananias to go and pray over and commission Paul for the work that God is fixing to set him out on. So the Lord said to him who is Ananias, Go. For he, which is Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell off of his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food. He was strengthened. Paul encountered the marvelous light of Jesus on the Damascus Road. It was so powerful, it struck him blind. And it wasn't until days afterwards that God removed those scales from his eyes and commissioned him with the work of the gospel to send it to Gentiles, which is every single one of us, for the glory and honor of his name. And then moving on from there, in Galatians chapter 1, Paul gives a further testimony to what happened to him that day. He says, You have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently. I tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. So Paul says, man, I walked in darkness for so long, and I thought that I was doing good in the midst of that. I was zealous for the things of God. I thought I was defending his honor. 
I thought I was living for the glory of his name. And then I met Jesus, whose light was so piercing to my darkness that it blinded me. And in the process of that, you know what Paul realized? He realized that everything that he thought he knew was wrong. And an entire brand new life had to be learned. That's why he says after, after that happened in Acts, what he's referring to in Galatians is he says, you know, after all that took place, man, I didn't instantaneously know what it meant to live for Jesus. I didn't instantaneously know what I was supposed to do. I didn't instantaneously understand how I was going to be his chosen vessel to carry the gospel to these people that didn't belong to my Jewish heritage. I didn't understand what God meant by all that. Those were the very things that I hated about him. Those were the very things that I couldn't stand about Jesus when he was on the earth was the fact that he would associate with people that didn't belong to my holy nation, to the people that I was a part of, the true people of God. He said, all these things I thought were backwards. And now you're telling me this is what my life is going to be? And he understood that a new life had to be learned. He said, that's why after my conversion, after Saul's conversion, he fell off the map for three years. We don't hear from him. He says, I went into Arabia, and you know what Paul did? Paul got along with Jesus and asked him to teach him everything that he would need to know. For three years. Three years of just personal consultation with God himself before he ever started trying to carry out a calling. Three years. An entire new life had to be learned. Paul had a past he even talked about it. I, man, I was former life in Judaism. I persecuted the church. I was advancing. I was top of my class. I was zealous for the traditions of my father. Paul had a past. He says, you know, that was me. I was the guy that, that hated the church. I was the guy that persecuted Christians. I was there when they stoned Stephen. I was giving my approval of that entire thing. He had a past. And you know what? His past, it didn't just disappear when he met Jesus. And neither does ours. I think some of us get confused sometimes and we, we think because it sounds good that once we come to faith in Christ that everything that's been a part of our past is just going to magically disappear. But it doesn't. Listen to me. In Jesus, your past gets covered, but it doesn't get canceled. Because your past story becomes a part of your present salvation. It's something that God uses as you continue down this life to give a testimony of his grace and his mercy and his goodness. By the blood of Jesus, it's covered, but it doesn't disappear. We're no longer in darkness, but we have to learn how to walk in the light. Listen, don't beat yourself up if you're struggling in your walk with Christ. Don't beat yourself up if you're struggling to have compassion or if you're struggling to find humility or patience. Don't beat yourself up if you're struggling to be more forgiving when you know you should be. Don't beat yourself up if you're struggling to exemplify more love than what you currently are. We are all in a part of that same struggle of trying to pursue after Christ, and it does not change instantaneously. It is a gradual adjustment that we get used to the more and more we learn to walk in the light the more and more and more we will stay in the light minds have to be renewed emotions and actions have to learn to come under an authority that they've never lived under before and this does not happen in a day but it does happen during the day what do you do with your day what are you doing with your day to more closely and obediently walk in the light of Jesus. What are you doing with your day? Are you spending time in his word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are you spending time around godly community? Are you talking about the things of God? Are you growing in the things of God? Do you see the areas in which that you are weak, that you need to strengthen and develop in? Or are you just sitting back and wasting your day? This stuff doesn't happen in a day, but it does happen during the day. So pursue after Christ. And day by day as you follow him, you will see that he begins to transfer 
where he begins to, to transform the fullness of your life, you will begin to naturally look more and more like him. Gradual adjustment. And even beyond that, it's a gradual thing, but there's a continual side as well, and that's the truth that when Christ transfers us from darkness into light, there is a continual illumination that is a part of that. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to his disciples saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Once Jesus has delivered you from darkness, you will never walk in it again. Never. It will no longer continue to be a part of your life. You may still battle darkness, but you will not live in darkness. Each and every one of us, when we are transferred from darkness into light, still deal with the daily battles that darkness wants to bring into our lives. But you don't live in that darkness anymore. Christ has completely removed you from that. And I think you should be encouraged by that. I think each and every one of us should be encouraged by that truth and by the reality that even though the darkness still surrounds, it does not envelop. It no longer can control your life. It no longer can require you to come in submission to its authority because you live underneath and you when you have the light and the abundant life of Jesus shining forth from you. And this light does not ever burn out. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said this of his church. He said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. I, don't, I can't speak for each and every one of you guys. I can speak for myself when I say that I'm no longer nocturnal. I don't live in the dark. I'm not used to the dark. I'm not friends with the dark. Actually, in a serious but not so serious kind of way, low-key, I'm scared of the dark. I don't like it. I love to to hunt and it's hunting season but even to this day I mean, I'll be walking through the woods before the sun comes up my flashlight man it's like all over the place I don't, I don't like the dark and I, and I don't like seeing people who profess to be followers of Jesus be comfortable with darkness. We are not. What, what business, God says, does light have to do with darkness? None. Why would we want to go back into those places that God redeemed us from? Don't meddle with it. Don't play around with it. Look, I, I know, hey, I told you earlier I wasn't going to attack Halloween and I'm not but some of us really need to evaluate should I be doing those things should I be opening up my heart should I be opening up my soul to those things those things that have nothing to do but with fear and with terror and with evil and with darkness hey listen don't don't play with it don't play with the darkness don't play with evil flee from it Run away from it. Don't be a part of it. You're no longer nocturnal if you're in Christ. So don't, don't just willingly walk in the dark places that you know you should not be in. Listen, I told you this. I want you to be encouraged by this. Like, If we are in Christ, we have the light of Jesus shining forth from us. And it's a light that will never burn out. Now, I know we don't need to be playing around with darkness we don't want to willingly walk into dark places. But the reality is, sometimes we find ourselves in those places, right? Sometimes we find ourselves surrounded by darkness. 
Sometimes we don't willingly walk into the darkness. Sometimes the darkness wants to seek us out. Sometimes the darkness wants to surround us once again. Sometimes the darkness wants to try and pull us back in. But the reality is, if you are in Christ, you have his light within you. So even if you find yourself in dark places, things are still illuminated around you. Why? Because the light of Jesus is shining forth. You do not have to fear. You do not have to be afraid. You can be strong and courageous. Why? Because his light will pierce the darkness around you. You know what darkness does? Every time a light comes on, it disappears. It's gone. It ruins. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. For you are all children of the light. Children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. Walk in his light, men and women of God. 